That's no love affair between Europeans and the European Union. That's the result of a new survey this week, just before Britain's referendum on EU membership. With or without Britons, the bloc is no longer popular. Welcome to State of the Union. The Pew Research Centre came up with the result after polling in 10 member states. Euroscepticism is gaining ground, and only just over half of Europeans still support the bloc. Although when it comes to expressing a view on a possible Brexit, only 16% think that would be good, against 70% who say it would be negative. But on the question of the sharing of power between the EU and member states, 42% would like to see a return of power to the national capitals. The financial and economic crisis and how it's managed by the bloc, structural reforms, social costs and the consequences of a possible Brexit. Just some of the questions debated this week at the Brussels Economic Forum. Whether Europe is ready for and have this plan B in case uh, you know, there is a Brexit, uh, I'm not sure at this time. Uh, I think that there is a great hope that they are not going to do that. Of course, it would be a crisis. It will not be easy. But we will move forward in any case. So I think that the problem would be more for the UK citizens. If they are out, they will have to accept the rules uh, defined by others if they want to have access to single market. So I think that finally rationality will prevail. Just some of the top European and international policymakers who attended the Brussels Economic Forum. It's the 16th year of the event, with debate focused on finding post-crisis solutions. The president of the European Investment Bank stressed that growth depends on new private investment. Europe is moving out of the crisis slowly, but only slowly, and we need to stabilize that upward trend. It should be uh, avoided that this uh, upward movement is stalled before it really has begun. And you have to analyze where's the problem. The problem is that we do not invest enough into our competitiveness. The Latvian finance minister explained that governments are not moving as fast as companies are. With one hand, we are actually trying to uh, foster the innovation, trying to boost the SMEs, uh, coming with the great ideas. And with the other hand, when, uh, when the new business models appear, like Uber, like uh, R&D, like uh, Netflix and others, the governments are actually not ready. We are starting to combat them because we are not able to collect the taxes. So what to do is just to know not only the dynamism of the companies themselves, but also of the governments, and in our case, the, the common EU structures, uh, uh, is of vital importance to keep the pace of the business environment uh, development. The Brussels Economic Forum is the European Commission's flagship annual economic event. My guest this week was at the Brussels Economic Forum, Pierre Moscovici, the European Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs. I spoke to him about reforms, the vote in Britain, and what's happening in his country, France. Mr. Moscovici, in your speech at the forum, you raised the need for structural reforms, but also the need to communicate, to explain the reforms to citizens. Does that mean it hasn't been done correctly, given what we're seeing in certain countries, including France, for example? Europe has just been through its most important crisis since the Second World War. And in this context, the context of higher deficits, exploding debt, economic structures that needed to be more competitive, reforms were carried out. They were necessary. Pension reforms, labor reforms in most countries, and all countries should do this. But there's also a price to pay for these reforms, a short-term economic cost, a social cost, a political cost, with the rise of populism. And that's why today I appealed for what I call the reforms of the second generation. This means reforms capable of reconciling Europeans with Europe, reforms that people are able to take ownership of. And I want to insist on the fact that now we've come through the crisis, we should take note of the damage, but also move on to the next step, a solid restart. 
We have to insist on education, what I call human capital, which enables us to be strong in terms of the workforce. It means not only primary and university education, but lifelong learning. Training is the big project, but also innovation, research and development. This will enable us to create the economy of the future and invest more, for example, in infrastructures. I think today the big task is to reconcile economics with the social and the politics, and to do this in such a way that Europeans can be proud of their reforms. Reconcile the economics and social issues, but when we see the labour reforms in France, which are out of step with what's been done in other states, and when we see the reaction in the street, don't you have the impression that France is a country that has difficulties carrying out reforms? The country is capable of reforming itself, but it has to do it by taking into account its own social structures, political, and plan the reforms well. Everyone can't do the same reforms in the same way, in the big and small nations. You have to take into account national circumstances, and so reforms can't be carried out in a standard way. But when it comes to labour reforms, I'm very clear. We need labour reforms, ambitious reforms, because otherwise you always have the same people in work and the rest excluded. If you want to have unemployment forever, don't change. If we want to be able to create jobs, yes, reforms are needed. The other important subject is the referendum on Britain's EU membership in just under two weeks. Polls show it's neck and neck. I imagine the Commission is prepared for the worst. Is there a plan? It's really about shared interests for the British and for the Europeans, that we don't work on another scenario. After, we will see what happens the day after. But it's hard to believe that the Commission does not envisage the worst, preparing in case of a vote for a Brexit, Britain leaving the European Union. No one can predict in a scientific way what will happen the day after. That's politics, the dynamics of it. We don't know what will happen. We ask ourselves, as an ordinary citizen, a simple question. What solution is the most beneficial for my country and for myself? And I haven't seen anyone able to prove economically that to leave the European Union is something positive. On the contrary, everyone could see, and international institutions showed us in a serious way, the economic risks of a Brexit. We have to avoid that, and I think British voters, no matter what their feelings or emotions, they will be rational. Now our tweet of the week from a red-faced David Cameron, who appealed for people to register to vote in the upcoming referendum. But the website for this crashed two hours before the deadline. In the end, it was extended by two days, which didn't make Brexit campaigners happy, considering these last-minute enrolments as not in their favour. Now a look at what's on the agenda. On Tuesday, NATO defence ministers meet to prepare for a summit in Warsaw in early July, amid tensions with Russia. On Thursday, the Eurogroup is expected to approve a new loan for Greece to the tune of just over 10 billion euros, unless there's a last-minute surprise. And on Sunday, the second round of municipal elections in Italy, with victory expected for the five-star movement candidate who's close to winning the mayoralty. Thanks for watching and have a great week.